Today we welcome Kate Starbird, who is an assistant professor at UW in their Human Center Design and Engineering uh, department. And uh, Kate started off doing her undergrad in CS at Stanford and uh, was also a basketball player um, at Stanford and went on to play in the WNBA for many years. You're also embarrassing played for me. the USA team, was very successful in basketball. Um, and when she, <laughs> when she finally hung up her high heels, no, sorry, <laughs> uh, hung up her shoes, she went back to do her PhD and went to University of uh, Colorado in Boulder and did her PhD in the Media Technology, or Technology, Media, and Society program. Um, her advisor was actually Leisha Palin, who was alumnus of UC San Diego. Um, and her research really looks at how uh, groups of people organize, sort of self-organize online to uh, address crisis events. So big disasters that happen, how people sort of organize and address these issues. And her talk today focuses on how uh, Rumors and misinformation spread around online, perhaps uh, somewhat inspired by the recent election season. Um, and hopefully she has some answers to these Don't have any problems. Answers. No answers? Okay. <laughs> open questions. I, I end with a lot of open yeah. questions. It should be interesting. Anyway, thank you and welcome, Kate. Thanks, Stephen. All right, so I'm excited about this. You, this slide's been there for a while, so I'm just going to, to jump in. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, my overall research as well as um, this particular talk will be around sort of rumoring during crisis events. So this photograph here um, is an interesting one. It's a, a woman wearing a funny hat and she's holding a, a phone. Uh, this photograph was taken uh, uh, in um, October 2012, at about the same time Hurricane Sandy was coming ashore on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And you can see this woman, and, and we can get some ideas, we can think about what she might be doing. Um, uh, if we look behind her at that sort of tree-car interaction that's going on, we can think that she might be, you know, sending a text or a tweet or an Instagram photo or something uh, uh, about what, what's happening. And um, in the aftermath of, of Hurricane Sandy, um, there was a lot of social media activity, millions of tweets, uh, mi uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of uh, Instagram posts uh, were happening. And at that time, I'd been researching, doing research in this um, area of uh, social media use during disaster events. And I got an email from a blogger, um, journalist, you know, it's kind of hard to tell the difference sometimes. I got, I got an email from this, this fellow and he said, you know, I want to do this article about how Hurricane Sandy was the first social disaster. Uh, can, you, can you help me? And I said, absolutely, I can help you. You cannot lead with the fact that Hurricane Sandy was the first social disaster. Um, so first, the first thing is, is that everything we know about disasters, the reason they are disasters is that they are inherently social. Uh, the reason that we care about them is because they impact our social lives. They disrupt the things we want to do. They, they cause injuries. They, they, they force us to, to, you know, uh, to uh, react in different kinds of ways. So they're inherently, they're inherently social because they affect people. Um, and at the same time, ever since we've had the sort of um, the, the tools we think of social media, but, but long before those, forums, emails, phones, whatever, whatever technology we, we've had, we've used those to respond uh, to disaster events. And though Hurricane Sandy saw a lot of activity, people had been using social media as we think about it for several years during disaster events in very fascinating ways. Um, and our, my research has looked at this intersection of social computing and crisis events. And by social computing, I mean all of those tools that we have for interacting in different ways, um, but not just the tools, I'm actually really focused on, focused on the behaviors that those tools enable. And I look at them, uh, I look at these behaviors in different kinds of crisis events. And what I mean by crisis events uh, include natural disasters like, um, like uh, hurricanes and earthquakes and um, you might not get this, but an inch of snow in, uh, inch of snow in Seattle is a major disaster. Um, and we've looked at some of those. And we've also looked at, more recently, a lot of man-made disasters, including terrorist events, um, which I'll actually, unfortunately, be, be focused on a little bit here. Um, 
In our work, we draw from a couple of different uh, traditions, but a lot of this, um, from my work with Leisha Palin at, at Colorado, um, draws from disaster sociology. So our understandings of disasters really um, are drawn from, from previous understandings of how disasters, how people respond to disasters offline, and we've carried those into the online world. And this is built into a kind of a new sort of subfield called crisis informatics, where we're looking at um, how people use, how people use uh, tools to respond uh, to disasters and how we communicate during them. There's a lot of opportunity at this intersection of social computing and, and disaster events. There are a lot of interesting things going on. So um, <coughs> people uh, armed with these devices that we carry with us almost all the time um, can now, and connected through social media, can take, uh, to, can take information, can take photographs, can, can share information with um, their loved ones, their neighbors, with emergency responders, with people all over the world in real time. And so we have this new ability to maybe enhance the situational awareness of ourselves and others by sharing this information and pulling it together. And there's a lot of sort of power in that, in that ideal, even though it's kind of hard to, to realize in some ways. There's also this opportunity for crisis responders to use these tools in real time to communicate to their publics. Um, and some have, been, some have been doing this very well. Four or five years ago, we used to complain that they weren't really doing it enough. And nowadays, a lot of local uh, law enforcement and even national law enforcement and, um, uh, excuse me, uh, humanitarian responders and also government responders are using social media to, to communicate in real time. Um, and these platforms are facilitating new forms of volunteerism where people come together um, to help each other and to help others online during disaster events. And a lot of my research has really focused in uh, on this sort of phenomenon and um, we've, we've looked at it for, for years and, I, and, it, and it is one of those things where these horrible things happen and, and we, these horrible events happen and then we get to watch some of the best of human nature where people come together, very pro-social behaviors to help other people and it's um, very heartening in some ways. Um, and at times we've compared this to, to uh, we've talked about it as crowdsourcing. Um, and, and I actually came, I signed up for this talk to give uh, a talk that was kind of like this. And then um, a couple of weeks ago, I got distracted um, by something that happened. And I thought, you know, what I really want to do is tell you more about my misinformation work that we've been doing, our work on rumoring during disasters. And so um, instead of giving that talk, I'm actually going to give a slightly different one and hopefully end with some provocative questions. Um, but another aspect of, of what happens during crisis events is misinformation. And this tweet was sent um, during Hurricane Sandy. Um, it was one of several very similar tweets sent by an account that was aptly named Comfortably Smug. Uh, and this one <laughs> contained, uh, you know, pretty, it was kind of a silly fake, <coughs> fake, uh, fake report. But he actually sent some other tweets that weren't so silly and did cause people to react to things in ways that were probably not the best. Um, and so uh, this is uh, um, a, a problem. And in the aftermath of the event, there was a lot of conversation online and in other places about this problem of misinformation during disaster events and this problem of people s spreading it. Um, as well as some provocative claims about how the crowd rose up to challenge this information in what one journalist called a savage correction from the crowd. And for the last few years, my research team has been investigating this concept of the self-corrected crowd. <clears throat> And this idea that people can perform collectively, so in the individual acts of sort of challenging information can co collectively help to identify false rumors and misinformation. Um, and it's something that, that, uh, that we'll, I'll be talking about today. Um, to give you a, <clears throat> a little background to this work, it has a couple different motivations. And one of those was that as we were doing this work on digital volunteerism, we began to talk to emergency responders about their use on, on, on social media. And they, th you know, they were talking about how they were really reluctant to use social media because they were afraid of the misinformation that was out there. Um, and, and, and that was one of their reasons that they continued to, to cite and still actually cite as being sort of, it, it makes uh, social media yes, less usable for them and they think it ma makes it less usable for the public and, and we can kind of consider that's true. Um, but it turns out um, that rumors existed before the internet um, and in fact they were always sort of part of crisis events. Um, this is something that people have known and talked about for, for a long time. In fact, um, uh, researchers uh, from disaster sociology and also social psychology have long positioned rumors as sort of the natural byproduct 
of um, collective sense making, the collective sense making process that occurs after disasters. As people come together and they try to make sense of imperfect information under conditions of an uncertainty and ambiguity, um, they kind of, they come up with theories and explanations and these become, these turn into rumors. Um, it's also interesting and important to know that rumors can be false, true, or, or somewhere in between, right? So we think about a rumor and we have this stigma, a rumor is bad, but in fact, rumors actually can be a way of coming up with pretty decent solutions um, or explanations for what's happening during a crisis event. So with this, this is the framing that we actually go into this, this problem um, thinking about. And so our, our work broadly has been looking at online rumoring during crisis events, and we've been uh, thinking about a couple of different questions. And the first one is sort of just how, do, how, how and why do rumors spread during crisis events? Um, and, and then within that, because we were interested in the self-correcting crowd, we asked, you know, how do people correct rumors online? And then um, we actually wanted to, to leverage that understanding of, of how people correct. We wanted to be able to operationalize it and maybe use it to identify um, rumors online automatically. And what I mean by that is we thought, you know, I think it's going to be hard to ever detect rumors just by the content in a piece of information because rumors can travel in so many different ways and, and, it, and that will be difficult. But maybe people correct rumors in similar ways, calling it a hoax or saying that's unconfirmed or, or saying no, that's not true. And so we thought that if we could find corrections in the crowd that we might be able to identify um, rumors. So sort of leverage the self-correcting crowd as a sensor for rumors. And so we sent off with this sort of set of, of research questions. And this is a three-year project we've been doing. Um, mostly, uh, I've been collaborating with my colleague, Emma Spiro, at the University of Washington I School. And at this point, we've looked at about 20 rumors from 10 different events. Um, I want to briefly give you some of the baseline methods that we use. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about certain methods we've used for different events as, as I go on. Um, but at a high level, there's a, a couple things we do. So we collect. Uh, tweets during crisis events in real time using the Twitter streaming API. Um, these are publicly available a APIs. Anyone can plug into them. We collect typically millions of, ev uh, of, of tweets for each event using keyword terms related to that event. We then try to scope those millions of tweets down into a subset of tweets that are related just to the rumor using a, a variety of different um, methods. And then from there, we actually code or classify each tweet and each rumor um, for a, a, according to a, a, a pretty um, now simple, it started out being more complex, but a simple coding scheme. And so what we do is we use manual coders still, although we're doing some machine learning as well. Um, we use manual coders to assign each tweet as either affirming the rumor or passing it along or denying or challenging the rumor. So we have these two sort of stances and we try to, to make sure each tweet fits in there. We have a neutral category we don't use very much. Um, and then we also look at each tweet and see if it has some expression of uncertainty about the veracity of the rumor. So these are kind of, we have some other codes that happen too, but these are the two big decisions that our coders make for, for each tweet. And we have sort of a large team of, of uh, researchers um, that have done this coding. And in fact, um, I talk about, I sometimes joke, I say, oh, we have a lot of undergraduates do this. I actually, all of us do the, the coding because a lot of the insights we have about the data have actually come from, the, from this tweet by tweet coding that we've done. Um, once we get a, a, a subset of tweets coded, we actually use um, a variety of different methods um, to, to poke at it. Uh, for me and my team, what we've done is usually used mixed method grounded approach to examining the digital trace data. And what I mean by that is we use both sort of quantification and visualization to look at the big patterns. And then we find interesting areas within those patterns and we delve down and we qualitatively sample and then we read tweets to understand what's going on here, or what's going on there. I talk about this as the sort of 10,000 feet and tweet by tweet view. And we kind of go back and forth between those different views to understand the data. And, and the, the research I'm gonna talk about at the end of this talk, we also interviewed selective selected Twitter users to get a better understanding, not just of, you know, for the, through their digital traces, we can make some, un, some in, we can interpret what might be going on, but let's actually ask them to talk about what might have been in their heads at the time that they were making some of these decisions. I'm gonna briefly go through a few related findings to sort of set the stage for the, 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 the study I wanna focus on today. Um, and, the, and, and the first one actually starts off in our first, um, the first study we did, which was on the Boston Marathon bombings. Um, which happened in 2013. And in this event, we actually, um, 
We didn't even know we were studying misinformation yet. We had a rapid grant. We collected some data. We went in to look at it, and the rumors sort of came to the surface as the thing that was most, most interesting to us. Um, and what we did here, I want to kind of explain what's going on through, through, the, through the data. Um, so we, um, we collected tweets in real time again um, using a, a, a few different search terms. Um, we ended up with about 10 million tweets. And, um, and then we were, we were trying to just explore what was going on in this data. So we created a co-occurrence network um, for hashtags. And what we did here, so this is a, a network graph where each node is a hashtag that we saw in our set. We took the top 100 hashtags, and then we connected those two hashtags if they appeared in the same tweet. You know, this, not a lot of tweets have, have two hashtags, but they were enough to, make some, to draw some really interesting conclusions. And, so, and then, and then we, we graphed them. And the more times, uh, uh, the more times those two, the more tweets that those two hashtags appear in together, the, the closer they are related, um, they'll, get a, they'll get a stronger connection. And then um, the size of the node is how many times we saw the tweet overall, and it's on, on a log scale, or, uh, I, I believe, um, so we can all view this. But what we did here is once we had this graph, we started poking at the different areas to understand what was going on. And so you can see a couple things going on. Um, so one of the first areas I want you to kind of look at um, is the, the Pray for Boston and Boston Strong area. And those were sort of uh, hashtags that were... Uh, uh, people were using to express solidarity um, with what was going on. And so we sampled a bunch of hashtags in that area, and as we were reading through tweets, we, already, we started to see a lot of internet meme rumors where people were taking advantage of those sort of messages of solidarity to spread clearly false rumors in order to maybe um, get, get likes or retweets on their account um, or something like that. One of, those, um, one of those rumors was a rumor uh, that a girl was running the marathon and was killed by the bombings while running the marathon. So there were a lot of things that were not true about that, but the main one is that this is the little girl that they said was running the marathon, and the girls this age do not run marathons, nor is she running a marathon. She's running a 5K, and she's not even running. She's probably walking. Um, and this also was one of the first images you would get on a Google search if you put girl running, right? So... Um, so we can, we can see what, what, uh, what happened there, right? 90,000 90, tweets. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things we, we do next after we, got, we found the rumor, we coded it, is we take sort of a, a temporal graph of what's going on. There's a lot going on here, but this is the overall volume over time of that, of that rumor. And you can see um, it spikes at a little, and I think this is number of tweets per 10 minutes. It might, yeah, it's on here. Um, and, and this is actually pretty typical of the kind of uh, progression of a rumor that we'll see. We'll see this, you know, large spike in, in, in the affirmations of the rumor and then sort of uh, an almost uh, an exponential decay. Every once in a while we'll get another spike related usually to the fact that a, a, an account with a lot of followers has tweeted it, so it grows again. So, so, so this is what we'll normally see. And then this is the correction, <laughs> the correction line right here. So these are the denials. Um, and so you can see, and this is pretty typical, we get huge sort of affirmations and then these very small denials. This was a little exaggerated. Uh, uh, the other internet meme rumor looked, very, looked similar, but the denial was a little bit proportionally uh, larger. Um, but, but this is what that looks like. And I'll show you some other, other different ones as well. So, um, so that was sort of the internet rumor. And then there's, a, uh, so there's other parts of this too. So I want to now that, uh, kind of lead you over here to this area where we had... Um, um, Watertown, Manhunt, FBI, News. And I don't know if you remember th this event, um, but what happened is a couple of days after the bombings, um, the FBI released two photographs, grainy photographs of the suspects. And at that time, two things happened. One is the suspects themselves went out and um, killed a police officer, stole a car, and then ended up in a firefight in Watertown. Um, with the police. But at the same time as that was going on, the online crowd decided to look and figure out who these, these suspects were, and they pointed the finger at someone who was actually not one of the suspects, and in fact had been a student at Brown University who had already taken his life but was missing at the time, right? So he, they falsely accused someone uh, of this rumor, and that false uh, accusation actually spread pretty, pretty far and wide um, and did some damage to, to his family. Um, but in this area, uh, what we saw was what we're calling sort of that sense-making rumor. When I talk about that sense-making earlier, people trying to figure out what was going on with ambiguous information, we have this rumor type that we've seen here and seen other places as well 
of, of sort of sense making. And um, the sense making actually often looks a lot uh, similar to the internet meme rumor where we had, you know, we've got a lot of um, affirmation, we've got a small denial signature. The denial signatures really don't get that big. Um, the difference with sense making is when we look at the uncertainty within the sense making rumor is that early on almost all of the conversation had, had, had uncertainty and as it was spiking a lot of things had uncertainty as well. And so we actually took from here that, that uncertainty is sometimes a better signal of a rumor, an earlier signal and a stronger signal of a rumor than a denial um, or a challenge because the denials, denials come later. And I, we have a, a paper about that, I'm not going to pack it here, but just kind of mention that, that some of these, these things look different. Um, and the last rumor I want, the last one, oh, I, I put it up there too fast. The last one I want to talk about is actually up in, in this corner. Um, and uh, it's uh, fortunately a, a rumor type. This is for all from our first study, but we've seen all these types over and over again. I, I now know that they happen um, in almost every crisis event. So up here we have Obama, false flag. Does anyone know what a false flag is? You want to explain a false flag? Yeah, please do. Uh, it's the idea that it's a, basically like a, a planted or um, contrived, like staged event uh, to justify more crackdowns on like gun rights or uh, something like that. Yeah, so exactly. It's a, the, the false flag idea is that someone has staged an event to blame it on someone else, or they've planted the flag of you know something's happened and they've uh, they've blamed it on somebody who's not actually at fault. And it's usually used to accuse like the government of being um, perpetrating 9-11, or in this case, the Navy SEALs uh, perpetrating the um, uh, Boston bombings. Um, and then close to it, just so we'll have that there, is this tag, TCOT. Does anyone know what TCOT is? I'm so happy for you. <laughs> so TCOT, I'm sorry, but what I'm about to do. So TCOT is top conservatives on Twitter. It's a politicized hashtag. <laughs> Where and it's fun. It was funny to me too until two weeks ago. Um, uh, <laughs> so and Tea Party, Tea Party is right here, and then um, and then the NRA is there, uh, and some other things. But TCOT is used by people uh, to sort of promote the conversation among communities of of like-minded people who talk about politics. Um, P2 is the progressive one, but what I've noticed most of the time that that shows up, people just always put that on the TCOT so they can start a fight. All right, <clears throat> and then, so that area for us was conspiracy theories, and um, within 20 minutes, Alex Jones put out a conspiracy theory that said that this event was a false flag, um, and that conspiracy theory rumor, and I'm sorry because I've never used it in a talk before, so I haven't got it inverted in the black and white, but, um, but uh, and, I, and we haven't even converted it back to our new coding scheme. We used a different coding scheme early on, but what I wanted to show you here was that the, the nature of these conspiracy theories is very different. The other ones, they kind of spike and they, they peter out in a couple of hours, maybe a day. Conspiracy theories just keep going. <laughs> and and they, it was still going, by the time we published this research, it was still going at a much lower level. But they keep going. They often get driven up by um, blogs. They have a lot, if you trace the URLs here, there's certain domains cause these things to spike, including Infowars, but there's other ones involved as well. Um, there was a lot of speculation, so th it, uh, they also had a lot of uncertainty. Um, we've, we've, we've combined our hedge and speculation into an uncertainty category. Um, but uh, so, so these, these signatures look a lot different from the other rumors, and, and we keep seeing them. We've, uh, um, Umpqua shootings were not real. Um, Paris attacks were not real. Um, so, so they have uh, Sandy Hook was not real. So there's a, a, a lot of the crisis events that we see that are man-made, people will, will have these same conspiracy theories show up again and again, and we're um, newly um, interested in them are going to go back through some of our data to, to reanalyze it to, to understand this better. All right, um, stepping from there to talk a little bit about the self-correcting crowd. Um, I showed you this picture. Um, we had this idea of the self-correcting crowd. There's our correction. Um, and this was typical over and over and over again. Um, and that is that we, we rarely had um, a strong uh, correction. And so um, we can't make really a lot of strong conclusions. You know, maybe all of these people learned it was false and just didn't bother to tweet again. Um, it's true that, that, that uh, rumor affirmations are more likely to get retweeted than rumor corrections. We've seen that again and again. 
Um, but it is likely that the number of people that see a rumor is a lot larger than the number of people that see its correction. So that is something that we can kind of understand from some of the things we, we've seen. Um, and, and that's problematic in, in some of the, the ways that we're beginning to learn even more. Um, there have been a couple times, so I said we've done about 20 rumors, there have been two rumors where we actually saw a really strong correction. And I want to tell you a little bit about one of them um, to show you kind of what happened. Um, and so this was a rumor that there was a plane, a WestJet plane that was hijacked um, and it was during uh, January 2015. It happened to be during a Seattle NFL playoff game on television. So I was sitting there half watching the game on my, um, on my computer and was able to catch this one pretty quick because the whole rumor was about an hour long and we had to collect it in real time. Um, but this rumor was that there was this plane from, uh, from Vancouver to Puerto Vallarta uh, and, it, and what happened was a flight radar system picked up a signal that suggested it might have been hijacked. It ended up on a, on a flight website, like a flight tracking website. Somebody screenshot it, spread it on Twitter, and then the thing took off on Reddit and Twitter, um, this rumor. And so um, the rumor itself um, basically looked like, um, you know, this WestJet uh, flight has sent a hijacking signal. It seems to be hij hijacked. And um, we see this kind of, sp uh, we see the spike at about 450 tweets per minute. Um, and then for the first time, we see like a, a self-correcting crowd, like the crowd, the, the, the tweets came in, a denial happened, it seemed to go up and then people seemed to listen and come down. And some of the same people who tweeted a firm actually corrected. And we were like, what happened? You know, what happened there? Um, so it turns out what happened was the WestJet company um, the guy turns out he was also watching the football game. He, because we talked to him, he was sitting at home monitoring, you know, uh, looking at his website. And he got he got pinged. He said, you know, people are talking about WestJet. Went online. He's like, what's going on? Figures out, oh, there's this rumor. Very quickly um, calls up, figures out what he can say, and then tweets out that no, there's not. There hasn't been a hijacking. Everything's okay. And this actually corresponds to people have this. They see this source that they actually trust, and so they retweet it and they say, okay, this is false, and people stop, stop tweeting the, the, the rumor. And so we actually see um, this major correction. And in fact, this, most of this whole spike are retweets of the WestJet account, people retweeting the WestJet account. So we've talked about this um, with emergency responders to say there really is a value for you to be online watching to see if there's misinformation so you can catch it and, and say, hey, this is, is not, this is not correct. The only problem is when we think about some of the other kinds of rumors, political rumors, there's no trusted site. In this case, WestJet was trusted. People saw them as sort of authori uh, having authority and being sort of neutral in terms of whatever judgments they might make, and so they were trusted. Um, but in other situations, it really um, may not work this way unless, unless the organization has, has credibility among the people who are tweeting. All right. Can I have a little water? So the last thing I want to talk about is um, a new study we haven't presented yet. It's coming out in um, CCW this year. And that is sort of understanding rumor correcting strategies. Um, it's a, uh, more qualitatively and actually through interviews to actually understand why people are taking certain kinds of actions, why they correct, why they don't correct, and what kind of strategies they use. And so um, for this one, I'm going to talk about two rumors from two crisis events. And one of them, I'm going to use the WestJet rumor. Um, and w which we just talked about. Um, and the other one's going to be a lot harder. The other one um, is going to be about the 2015, 2015 uh, Paris attacks. Um, and I know we all remember these. They weren't so long ago. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, um, this is the hardest part about being a disaster researcher is we get really excited about our work. And yet some of the things we talk about are pretty heavy. Um, and this event was, was very catastrophic. Um, uh, so th these were a set of coordinated terror attacks uh, that took place throughout Paris in November, on November 13, um, uh, 2015. Um, and it was an extended event with uh, hostage situations. There were 130 fatalities and more than 350 people were injured. Um, important things about this, this event were that there were multiple sites affected and, and there were many rumors. Um, one of our interviewees sort of described it th this way. This person was there at the time. It's really hard to convey how little everyone knew. 
there were so many rumors flying around where there were attacks going on, how many attacks there were, whether or not they were coordinated, whether or not it was all a hoax or a prank. No one knew anything for sure. There were things going around about, on Twitter about Leal, about the Louvre, about so many places in Paris that weren't at all targets, as it turned out. Um, and so this rumor is actually about, uh, about Leal, and that is, um, Leal is a shopping mall at the center of Paris. It's a popular tourist spot. It's also, locals go there as well. Um, during the attacks, while they were ongoing, uh, it was rumored that Leal was a, was a site of the attacks. And, um, and, and so we ended up focusing on this, um, on this rumor as the second rumor in, in our event. And I want to say for, for this, uh, I, we do a lot of research where I actually put tweets up. For this uh, research, these tweets are not real. I, we've al altered the text of all the tweets because we don't want, to, want you to know who, who sent them um, because we have done interviews with these folks. The methods for this research built off of our, our, our other structure and, and we just went a little bit further with them. Um, we created a subset of tweets related to each of these rumors. We coded English tweets in each subset as affirm or deny and, and also uncertainty, though we won't talk about that. Um, for WestJet, they were about the same number of um, affirms and denies. For Leal, it was more like our typical rumor where we had a lot of affirms and very few denying tweets. Um, we also went and identified which tweets had been deleted. So we went back at, uh, a few months later for West, I think six weeks later for WestJet and two weeks later for Leal. We went back and for each tweet we had and went to see whether it was deleted or not. Um, and this is interesting. I'll talk about why we needed it, but it's interesting to note, shouldn't be surprising, um, uh, tweets that affirmed the rumor were far more likely to have been deleted than tweets that denied the rumor. Right? Um, and so we find this out again and again, um, but it's, it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, and so what we did was for each account that has sent one, at least one tweet, we went and identified their, their pattern of tweets for their rumor. And so if they affirmed a tweet and then affirmed another tweet, uh, sorry, if they affirmed the rumor, affirmed the rumor, and then sent, uh, and then deleted one of those affirmed, and then sent like a rumor denying tweet or a challenge, they would be an affirm, affirm, delete, deny. Um, and so uh, we then grouped people, there's too many different things, we then grouped people by different patterns and, and, and combined a few things into sort of five different groups. Um, affirm onlys, deny onlys, affirm denies, affirm deletes, and affirm delete denies. And what we were trying to do here is kind of see different kinds of behavior so we could talk to people that had, em had uh, employed different strategies around correction. Um, and so we, recruit, we attempted to recruit multiple people from each group. Um, we recruited them through the Twitter platform uh, using sort of a subtle public tweet and then later we followed up with a private direct message. And um, it turned out to be much harder to recruit for some groups than others. Um, I'm not going to speculate a lot about why this is, but you can see that the folks that had um, sort of more rich behaviors and especially ones that denied, uh, the, the, the denied the rumor at some point were more likely to respond to our efforts to recruit them than folks who only sent affirms or only sent deletions. We actually sent probably three times as many invites to people from the affirm only and affirm delete and only ended up with one person um, who agreed to do an interview from those groups. Um, uh, from that, we had conducted one hour uh, interviews remotely. Uh, in those interviews, we provided participants with the list of their tweets. So we let them look at the tweets that they sent during the event and we asked them to talk us through those tweets as well as to talk us through some more general situations or some sort of imagined situations. What would you do if? And we had 15 total interview participants, um, five ident self-identified as journalists, which we thought was interesting as well. So the people who decided to respond to us, we, we probably sent out 150 invitations. So the people who sent, decided to respond to us were more likely to be journalists. Um, for the Leal ru rumor, this is also interesting, four had lived um, or were living in Paris at the time and two were actually living in the Leal area during the attacks. Um, and so their data is from the perspective of people that were there. We have a, a few different findings. I want to kind of focus uh, on three that we think are relevant to sort of rumor correcting strategies. Um, we have some other findings as well that will appear in, in later work. Um, but um, one of them was corrective objectives. Like why were people trying to, what were, who were they trying to correct? What were they trying to correct? So when we talk to folks, um, one corrective objective, perhaps the most obvious one, is to correct yourself. So you've sent, you've sent out a rumor and um, you realize, you've sent out a rumor related tweet and you realize that you did something wrong. You have three options. You can delete it, you can correct it, or you can delete it and correct it. 
Um, and there's different sort of motivations for these. One, for these I'm going to talk, uh, expend a little bit uh, on them later. Um, but one of the things we noticed in sort of, when I choose to correct myself, um, there was two paths to take. There were implicit uh, uh, self-corrections and explicit self-corrections. And when we asked folks about their general strategies for correcting, like what if you sent a rumor, most folks said, oh yeah, I would totally, I would, I would say I'd done something wrong and I would apologize. And yet when we look at our data, very few people <laughs> actually did that. Um, it turned out to be really rare that people would explicitly self-correct. Most of the time what people would do is just um, post a, an update tweet that said, uh, that, that said something that was contradictory to the early one and they would think of that as their, their correction. So uh, implicit self-corrections were far more common in our data. The second kind of corrective objective was not to correct yourself, um, was to correct the information space. So almost all of our interviewees who took corrective action explained it as, so either they deleted a tweet or they denied a tweet, or denied a rumor. Um, they, when they took corrective action, they described it as, I wasn't correcting myself, I was trying to make sure the information space had the best information out there possible. So it wasn't really about you know, something I had done, it was about, it was about the information space. Um, and in, in this example, this woman who was actually at the scene, she first, she was sitting at home, she heard about the, the rumor, um, she was following online what was going on, and she heard a rumor that, that Leal had been affected, and she lived in Leal. So she actually tweeted out breaking, breaking news, something similar to this, breaking news, there's a report of an attack in Leal. And then she went out of her house towards, Leal, towards the shopping center to see what was going on. And later, she comes back 12 minutes later and says, actually, there's nothing going on, there's not been an attack here. Um, <clears throat> and she posted this correction. So even though she had sent a, a rumor-related tweet in, in the beginning, when we talked to her, she explained her rationale wasn't to correct herself, but was to make sure that the, the information out there was correct. She wanted to, to correct the information that was out there in the perspective of someone who was actually there. Even people who just sent denial tweets, they'd never sent an affirmation, um, they, they usually directed their correction at the information space. So say I, I didn't even share a rumor, but I sent some rumor correcting tweets um, or some, denying, some rumor denying tweets. It's, it, usually when we talked to them, it wasn't, oh, I wanted to tell someone else they were wrong. It was, I want to make sure there's the best information out there. And this, this person says, no, I wasn't correcting anyone. I was just providing information. I was not taking aim at the people who were speculating. I was trying to find the best correct information that I could. People were very reluctant to tell us that they had directly correct someone else. And they were also very careful, they said, about not correcting other people online. So they wanted to make sure that they were correcting the information, not, not a particular person. There was, however, one user in our set who did, um, did do uh, this sort of correcting another. Um, and if we actually look at, at that kind of behavior more broadly, we can count sort of 30, 34 times in the WestJet and 10 times in the Leal rumor. We see a rumor denying tweet that has a mention at the beginning. And, um, and so we have sort of a handful of these examples. And we talked to one person who actually did correct someone else. And, and he explained that correcting other, others is the right thing to do uh, if it means redirecting people to the right kinds of information. But this person had a lot of followers and a lot of social capital. It was actually a professional athlete um, in Europe uh, and, and had a lot of social capital and, and felt like it was, he it was okay to correct people and had actually done it in other events before. So we do have a persona of people that do correct other people, but most users um, kind of try to avoid this behavior. One of the more interesting things we found was on this issue here of to delete or not to delete. Um, that's sort of the question of the day. Um, and participants gave complex and often conflicting rationale for why they would or would not delete a tweet. <clears throat> In this example, if it's retweeted and I delete it, I think it's deleted from all the other feeds. So I would definitely, definitely delete it. Unless there was some conversation around it. And then, and then I'm not sure I would, I would delete it. Right? So you can see how this individual weighs different concerns about maybe the number of retweets something has had or um, whether or not there's conversation around it. Others noted con uh, considerations as to whether the information out there could cause harm to someone. If it could cause harm, then I'll delete it. If not, I want to leave it out there. Um, and so one of the things that we kept seeing over and over again was this trade-off between accuracy and transparency. Um, in other words, should you make sure that the information space is clean or should you make sure to leave a truthful record? So people didn't want to be seen as hiding something. So they didn't want to delete tweets because they didn't want to look like they were trying to hide something from other people. Um, and yet there was this other idea that you want to get that bad information out, there as soon as, out of there as soon as possible. 
There are people who say you should never delete. I'm not that kind of person. For some, deleting might be the best practice, but the worst thing is to have bad information out there, particularly on Twitter, because any individual tweet not seen in a stream is out of context. If that tweet is seen and you do not see the correction tweet, then that's true. So this is really interesting for us because it talks about how these explanations of whether or not to delete, um, they include explanations of how the person thinks the system works and how they think the system is displaying information to them and to other people. And they're trying to take that into account as they're making decisions of, in real time, very quick decisions of what to do um, related to this uh, time and safety critical information. So the last sort of uh, framework here, and I'm gonna try to put them all together in the end, is this idea of a locus of responsibility. And this kind of speaks to some of the same ideas. Due to how we framed the questions and presented them their tweet record, interviewer, interviews, interviewees all spent some time trying to rationalize why they treated a, t uh, tweeted a false rumor, why they shared this false rumor. And so they were telling us why they kind of do, were doing it. And some of them outright took responsibility, they blamed it on themselves, right? That, this one was me and I was wrong. I found out that I was wrong and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, right? And so some people really, they, they thought, you know, I did something wrong there and I fixed it. But other folks try to blame other people. A lot of people blame the upstream users. They pointed at someone else. You know, I tweeted it because of this person citing this. I probably should have been vague, but the fact of the matter is, when I see that news outlet reporting it, I'm like, okay, it seemed much more real to me, right? And so we saw a lot of people pointing, you know, it's not my fault, I don't have to take responsibility, it's an upstream user. We also saw one, folks, one, one person pointing at downstream users. They should know better. I tweet what I tweet, it's my right to tweet, I'm, I, I'm participating, and it, you know, if a rumor spreads because someone retweeted me, they, sh they should have known better, they should have verified, they should have checked their sources. Other folks uh, cited the anxiety, ambiguity, and speed of crisis events, and still other people sort of put the responsibility on Twitter um, at least to some extent, to talk about how the design features of Twitter um, sort of facilitate the spread of rumors due to the lost context and the, 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 the high-speed nature of information sharing there. And finally, there was a group of users, and not a group, but because some people pointed at multiple ones of these, right? They kind of explained it in different ways. But several of them were talking about, well, it's the crowd. The, cr the crowd should take, res the, it's the crowd's fault, and you know what? The crowd's going to fix it. Um, speaking to that idea of the self-correcting crowd. Um, I think rumoring is part of Twitter and something we have to understand. That's going to happen. It's like a free information sharing tool. Everyone has freedom of speech, hopefully. Um, and hopefully, if someone is spreading false information, that information is going to be quickly debunked through other people responding and giving their own insight to something. Right? So this idea of like, you know, the crowd is going to work it out. We can all just sit here and share. We don't have to worry about sharing misinformation because the crowd is going to fix it. Because eventually, we're going to get to the truth. Right? They, they had kind of internalized this idea of the self-correcting crowd, and that sort of lets you participate in a way um, that, that maybe feels good during these disaster events. So some people, act, uh, so how someone framed the locus of responsibility, and we can't test this yet, we're going to try to, we, didn't, we couldn't test it with interviews, we plan to, but how they framed the locus of responsibility sort of shaped or guided uh, their decision of whether or not they were going to correct, and how they were going to correct, whether they're going to delete it, or whether they're going to correct it and delete it and whatnot. So we kind of saw that shaping. And to try to put this all together into sort of, I don't want to call it a model, but it, sort of a, a understanding it all together, um, we can think about, and this might be hard to see, but someone sort of encounters conflicting information, and then they're faced with these sort of considerations of who's responsible and am I responsible, is the crowd responsible, and then they have to make a decision, do I correct myself? Do I correct the information space? Do I want to correct someone else? And these decisions are kind of made uh, interactively as they're thinking about things. Um, sorry, that should be there. Um, <clears throat> and then there's this other piece to it, and that is, and that is and I've tried to define this box in different ways. And one of those is to think about imagined audiences, right? I think this is another piece of the equation that it helps us decide what's going on. So Goffman's classic work of the presentation of self explained that our audiences guide our behavior, right? I'm getting feedback from you that tells me, you know, I should stop here in a couple minutes, which I will, um, but, right, so I, but I've got this, this audience here. Um, Marwick and Boy talk about this in, in online and say, you know, online we, we, don't, we can't see our audiences, so we imagine, we imagine the audiences, and then we behave in ways that we think, you know, we, that, that imagining of the audience shapes our behavior. 
right? And we think to some extent that's, be, uh, that's at play here, but I want to unpack that a little bit further. There's, there's another concept here, um, and that is not just considering how, how the, the imagined audience, but considering how the system works is something that's shaping my behavior as well. And this speaks a little bit to, I think, what Islami and all were getting at with their idea. Um, they were actually applying a, an existing idea of folk theories to the online space. So there's this classic work on this idea of folk theories that we have about how technology work. Um, they, the classic example is how we use a thermostat with the heater, and some of us have different models of how the thermostat works, and that determines how we use it. Um, and, some, and I guess all of our models are wrong. Some of them are more wrong than others. But even a faulty model can actually guide uh, productive behavior that, that works. Um, Islami and I'll talk about this in the context of Facebook algorithms and how people think the algorithms work to distribute their information, shape what kind of information they post and how they post that information. I have an example. My partner wanted something to get seen with a political message, and she knows that all of our Facebook friends, when she puts a picture of both of us and tags us both, um, we got married a few years ago, and we had some other things. So pictures of us, for some reason, get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, traction. And so she posts a picture of us, tags us, and then says something about how the election is going to possibly take away our, our rights, right? Because she thought that that was going to get us more views from a broader audience in our, in our, in our um, Facebook group. But we can imagine this is happening also in the decision of, of how to you know, participate in rumors. It's to think about how, does the, how do the algorithms work to distribute things? Um, and I want to kind of put these together in a, in, in a way that, that, that captures what we saw what was going on. So our ideas about how the system works, including who our audiences are, and how those audiences will act upon the information we share are shaping um, how we correct ourselves and others uh, during crisis events. So it's not just who our audiences are, but it's how they're going to interact with that information. What are they going to see and what are they going to do with that? And, it's, and all of that together, as, uh, uh, in addition to a system that we can't even see and algorithms that we don't know, are things that we're thinking about in real time during these crisis events to try to figure out what to do. And one of the messages I wanted to take from this um, sort of practical message is that we are the self-correcting crowd. Uh, the, the information is going to get corrected if we correct it, right? And so how do we communicate with people that, um, that it, it may be through design, how do we design systems that help people realize that they are the self-correcting crowd, to give them feedback about what their impact is, how that system works, where their information is going, and maybe there's a way to, to reduce the amount, uh, the reduce the spread of uh, misinformation um, th through that. All right, what's next? Last couple slides. I know I've only, I've, I'm two or three minutes over already. Um, what's next? I want to leave you with a couple questions. The reason I switched my talk today, um, I think this is part of a broader problem of um, regarding the spread of misinformation uh, through social media. I'm talking about it as information pollution, where social media can't be useful, and in fact, they can instead be harmful if we can't distinguish between what's true and what's false. And I think it's becoming increasingly hard for us to do that. And so I'm trying to think with my students, and I've got a couple great students who are thinking about this, about different ways of designing to reduce information pollution. Um, in some ways, these are crowdsourcing systems, or maybe there's crowdsourcing solutions. Maybe we have systems to detect misinfo, but I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think it's as simple as, as marking misinformation in some way. We used to talk about if we could take all these challenges and then just when you see the tweet, it doesn't take the tweet out, but just show that that information is being challenged or denied somewhere. OK, that, that, that might be helpful. Um, but also, maybe there are, uh, are, are systems that can sp support better reflection and more mindful practices about how we engage in, in our online activities, or even give us that feedback about, about how the system is redistributing it, about who's seeing it, about how our tweet is making an impact, and people are retweeting it, and it's a false rumor, and we need to get it out of the space, right? So perhaps we need um, be just better tools, and then better tools to remind people that, um, that we are the self-correcting crowd. All right, and with that, I'm done. I want to thank tons and tons of students. I've got some of their names up here if they were directly involved in this particular research, but I've worked with probably more than 30 students in the last five years through various means. I want to thank them and my collaborators, and thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.